Hello, this is David Diga Hernandez, and you're watching Spirit Church here on the Encounter TV Network. I've ministered on the benefits of prayer and fasting before, but I want to teach you how to fast and pray that you might experience the power of this spiritual practice. Perhaps the most neglected of all spiritual practices is prayer and fasting. Most believers participate in worship. Some believers have a prayer life. Few believers are consistently faithfully devoted to the Word of God, and even fewer believers than that make fasting and prayer a regular part of their spiritual journey. Now, there are a couple reasons for this. Number one, I believe that many Christians are simply unaware of the many benefits of prayer and fasting. Now, I did do a teaching on the benefits of prayer and fasting, and you can find that with the rest of our content. But right now, I want to focus in on that second reason. There's another reason why I believe many Christians neglect the spiritual practice of prayer and fasting, and that is simply because many Christians don't know how to fast and pray. And that's what I'm going to cover right here and now. Those simple dynamics, what is prayer and fasting and how do you implement it in your everyday life? I'm going to show you how to do that, but first I want to read a verse to you, James 2.17. Even so faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. In other words, faith requires action. And prayer and fasting is faith in action because it's a response to the Word of God. You see, we may not understand all of the mechanics or all of the dynamics behind prayer and fasting. We may not understand why prayer and fasting works so well, but we understand that it works well because we believe the Word of God. Whenever you feel spiritually stuck or stagnant, carry out an act of faith. Perhaps in this season of your life, you feel as though your spiritual growth is coming to a slow. Or perhaps you feel like you're taking a few steps backwards. That is a good time to pray and fast. In fact, it's good to pray and fast even before you feel that spiritual stagnation because it can prevent that spiritual stagnation. Now, we are told to persist when we pray. Matthew 7, 7 says, Keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. So this is talking about persistence in prayer. So when you pray and fast, you're stepping out in faith. And when you pray and fast, you're participating in persistent prayer. Like a sledgehammer chips away at a brick wall, so our prayers chip away at spiritual barriers. And fasting adds more strength to the strike. Now, I want to read a portion of Scripture to you that will give us our basic level of understanding for prayer and fasting. Matthew 6, verses 16 through 18 say this, And when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do, for they try to look miserable and dishelved so people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, that is the only reward they will ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face, then no one will notice that you are fasting except your father who knows what you do in private, and your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. So, there are a few things that we can glean from this portion of Scripture. Number one, fasting is to be done regularly. Jesus said, and when you fast, or as often as you fast, this is basically implying that fasting is to be a regular part of the life of the believer. Secondly, we see that it's something we're to do privately. Verse 18 says, Then no one will notice that you are fasting. So it's important that we not fast with the motive of being seen and praised by others. If your motivation for fasting is simply the admiration of other believers, then that's all the reward that you're going to get. You won't receive the other benefits that come from fasting. You will only receive the admiration of people, which is ultimately emptiness. Now, you don't want to get superstitious with this. I've seen some believers when they're fasting, they go overboard trying to hide the fact that they're fasting. Jesus wasn't saying make it super top secret. He was simply saying that you ought to do it privately and don't make it 
a, an intentional thing where you're trying to get others to see that you're fasting. It's not like what people imagine a birthday wishes where, oh, don't let them know what you wish for, otherwise it won't come true. Fasting doesn't work that way. And it's not like if somebody discovers that you're fasting, that all of the results are going to be taken away. This is simply Jesus addressing that need to be praised by others that rests inside the heart of every human being. We're also to fast in faith. My fasting is done before God, not before people. Now, I understand that you can do a group fast in the New Testament church. We saw that many times they would fast together. They would do corporate fasting. Now, there's no way they could hide the fact that they're fasting from each other if they all wanted to fast together. Otherwise, that group fast couldn't have been coordinated. But when we fast in faith, we're doing it before God. Yes, others may know about it. Yes, others may participate with us in fasting. But ultimately, it's done before God. And when we do it before God, it's because we're doing it in genuine faith. And finally, it's to be done prayerfully. A fast without prayer is just a diet. So now I want to show you the different types of fasting that you'll see in the scripture. And from these different types of fast, you can make a choice and you can pray about it. You can ask the Holy Spirit to guide you and he'll begin to show you which direction you should take. Now, here's my definition of fasting. This is based on my study of the scripture. The discipline of abstaining from food or something desired for a given period of time in order to devote oneself more to prayer and the word of God. First of all, we have the food fast. Matthew chapter 4 verse 2 says, After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Now there's no mention here of Jesus becoming thirsty. When Jesus was fasting in the wilderness, the devil didn't tempt Jesus with water. The devil tempted him with bread. Why? Because he was fasting food. Now, I'm going to kind of throw in a little tangent here because this is where the question arises where people say, well, what about juices or coffee or smoothies? Look, food by definition, at least in the context of biblical fasting, is anything that brings you nourishment, nutrition, or strength. So if you say, well, I'm fasting, but I'm just doing liquids or I'm just doing smoothies, you're actually eating, but the food you're taking in is just in a different form. So when we fast food, it's basically switching over to water. And that is because we want to learn to rely upon God's grace and power and his word. That's because we want to learn to discipline the flesh. There are many different reasons we fast. But when we're fasting, we're removing that which strengthens us in the natural realm. So if you're fasting and you just hop over to juices or smoothies, it sort of defeats the purpose. So there's the food fast. Then there is the food and water fast. A couple examples here, Esther 4.16. Go and gather together all the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will do the same. And then, though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. If I must die, I must die. So there we see the mention of no food or water. Ezra 10, 6 says, He spent the night there without eating or drinking anything. He was still in mourning because of the unfaithfulness of the returned exiles. Next, there is a dietary fast. Daniel 10, 3 says, All that time I had eaten no rich food, no meat or wine crossed my lips, and I used no fragrant lotions until those three weeks had passed. So this type of fast, some refer to as a Daniel fast. Now there's some debate in the Christian world about whether or not the Daniel fast should be considered a fast or whether a diet should be considered a form of fasting. But in all reality, if you're having to enact discipline in order to complete the fast, then that's going to benefit you in that you're learning to overcome the cravings of the flesh. Then there is the abstaining fast. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. Afterward, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So here the scripture is talking about sexual abstinence, a period of sexual abstinence for married couples. 
And really this opens the door for other types of fasting because though this scripture is specifically talking about a period of sexual abstinence, we see that other things that you desire can be given up for prayer. So if sexual relations can be given up for a certain period of time in order for one to focus more on prayer, then that means that there are other things that can be set aside in order to focus more on prayer. Now, this wouldn't be considered a dietary fast or a food fast or a food and water fast. This is just to abstain from something. There is some legitimacy to people saying, I'm going to fast social media. There is some legitimacy to people saying, I'm going to fast TV. There is some legitimacy to people saying, I'm going to fast that hobby because what they're doing is they're removing something in their lives that is natural or earthly or mundane and mediocre, and they're replacing it with a time of spiritual devotion. So an abstaining fast can be many different things. Indeed, this is an indication that you can fast other things besides food. Now, once you know what you can fast, the question arises, how long should I fast? How long should I go for? And we all hear those stories of the people who fasted 40 days. And if you're just starting out, it's probably best that you start with a shorter period of time. So here's a few things to consider, though. Going back to what I was talking about uh, with the food and water fast, whenever you see a fast that goes beyond three days, typically you'll find in the scripture that it's a food fast. In other words, people who fasted food and water didn't go for longer than three days. They would go one night or one day or three days. And this is because the average person can go without food for about 21 days and without water for about three days. You have to exercise wisdom. You have to seek the Holy Spirit's guidance when you're fasting. And don't be like these people who just want to go out and do it just to say that they did it. You have to really be led by the Spirit, especially if you're doing a food and water fast. Because I've heard stories, sadly, about pastors who went on 40 days of fasting, not realizing that Jesus didn't fast water for 40 days. He only fasted food. And they end up dying. I'm serious. I've heard these stories. I've seen the news reports. And this is why we must exercise wisdom. So this is also why it's important that you take care of your health. If fasting is to become a regular part of your life, you must be healthy as much as is in your control. So if you look in the book of Esther in 416, I read this when I was talking about the food and water fast, you'll see that uh, there was no eating or drinking, but for three days. In the book of Ezra, there was no eating or drinking, but that was for the night. So that water fast doesn't go beyond three days. And even then, be very careful with the water fast and make sure you're exercising wisdom there. So there's different lengths of fasts that are seen all throughout the scripture. There's the partial day fast, Judges 20:26 20, says, Then all the Israelites went up to Bethel and wept in the presence of the Lord and fasted until evening. They also brought burnt offerings and peace offerings to the Lord. So that was a partial day fast. They just fasted until the evening. There's the one day fast, 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 12. They mourned and wept and fasted all day for Saul and his son, Jonathan, and for the Lord's army and the nation of Israel, because they had died by the sword that day. So there we saw they fasted all day. There's the three day fast, Esther 4, 16. Go and gather all the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. So there again, we see that when they're fasting water, it doesn't go beyond the three days. You will see it like with Moses. He was supernaturally sustained by God. But when you're before the Lord, literally face to face, then maybe you consider a food and water fast for 40 days. But until then, remember to exercise that wisdom. Then we see the one-week fast. This is 1 Samuel 31, 13. Then they took their bones and buried them under a tamarisk tree at Jabesh, and they fasted seven days. There's the 21-day fast, Daniel 10, 3. All that time I had eaten no rich food, no meat or wine crossed my lips, and I used no fragrant lotions until those three weeks had passed. There's the 40-day fast, Matthew 4, 2. We'll read it again. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. By the way, it's interesting that Jesus became hungry after fasting 40 days and 40 nights. In other words, in some instances, there is the supernatural ability to feel no hunger during the fast. 
I myself have not reached this point yet. And as I mentioned, there's the supernaturally sustained fast, such as we see in Exodus 34, 28. Moses remained there on the mountain with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. In all that time, he ate no bread and drank no water. Now that is supernatural. And the Lord wrote the terms of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, on the stone tablet. So in conclusion, it appears that we can fast for any given length of time. The partial day, a one-day fast, three-day, one week, 21-day, 40-day, a supernaturally sustained fast. But I must caution you again to exercise wisdom. Know your health limits. I would even say consult with your doctor, your physician, before going on an extended fast. That is the exercise of wisdom. That's not a lack of faith. That's not a lack of spirituality. In fact, there is great spirituality in the practice of wisdom. So, you know what to fast. You know the different types of the lengths of fast, but how often should you fast? Luke 2.37 says, Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. So in the New Testament, you're not going to find a command directed at the believer indicating how often they should fast. Now, there are some historical writings that seem to indicate that it was proper to fast twice a week. Uh, Luke 18, 12, someone was bragging, I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. But again, there's nothing in the New Testament that says the New Testament believer is obligated to fast twice a week. So we're not given in the New Testament a clear command that says, here's how often you should fast. So we know what you can fast. We know how long the fast can go for. But as far as how often you should fast, you have to be spirit-led. You have to hear from the Holy Spirit. Now, this is my opinion I'm about to give you. I want to always draw a distinction between my opinion and what the Scripture says. Here is my opinion. I'm about to give you my thoughts on the matter. My opinion is that you fast at the very, very, very least, at the very least, quarterly. I would even say at least monthly, a one-day fast, a one-day Daniel fast. Do something regularly that helps you to subject the flesh to the self-control that's brought about by surrender to the Holy Spirit. So in conclusion, there is the food fast. There is the food and water fast. There is the dietary fast. There's the fast where you abstain from things that you desire. That can be social media. That can be hobbies and so forth. The different lengths of fast, a partial day, a one day, a three day, one week, 21 day, the 40 day, and then the supernaturally sustained fast. How often should you fast? The scripture does not indicate how often the New Testament believer should fast, but it should be a regular part of your life. As we see in Luke 2, 37, that this woman of God was in the temple there. She was day and night presenting herself before the Lord, worshiping with prayer and fasting. It was a regular part of their lifestyle. And so I want to encourage you to do the same thing. Make prayer and fasting a regular part of your lifestyle. And I know that you'll begin to see breakthrough that you never imagined even possible. Father, in the name of Jesus, help us to apply this wisdom. Help us to apply this wisdom and commit ourselves to this powerful spiritual practice of prayer and fasting. We make that commitment to you today, Lord, that we will begin to make prayer and fasting a regular part of our lives, simply so that we might be more like you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. I want you to say it because you believe it. Say, amen. Well, that's it for the lesson. I want to welcome now the new members of Spirit Church. There you are up on the screen. We love you. We're praying for you. I always say that because I always mean it. If you like information on how you can join our online church Go to davidhernandezministries.com slash spiritchurch. And now to your comments. These comments come from the teaching, What If the Holy Spirit Left the Earth? Now, this was a little bit of a different teaching that I did. I understand that the Holy Spirit won't leave the believer. I understand that the Holy Spirit abides with us faithfully. But I really want it to get us thinking about how much we need the Holy Spirit. I want it to inspire in you a greater appreciation for what the Holy Spirit does. And so I laid out the scenario, what if the Holy Spirit left the earth? 
And in hearing that, I think you're going to have a greater appreciation for the person of the Holy Spirit. You can find that with the rest of our content while you're looking for that. It's titled, What If the Holy Spirit Left the Earth? Uh, you can go ahead and follow us on all of our social media accounts. And when you subscribe to us on YouTube, make sure you click that notification bell so that you can be notified when we release new content. Here are the comments from What If the Holy Spirit Left the Earth? By the way, if you want me to potentially read one of your comments on a future episode of Spirit Church, then go ahead and leave a comment in the comment section right now. Sanja von Niekirk writes, What a great reminder of the wonderful work that the Holy Spirit is doing, and amen to the prayer. Father, please help us appreciate, acknowledge, and honor the Holy Spirit for everything He is doing on earth. Santi Jayaraman writes, Thank you, Brother David, for your guidance. I came across your ministry when I wanted to know more about the Holy Spirit. I have learned a lot and been very inspired. Thank you, brother, and God bless. Well, this is the Holy Spirit's channel. We're fulfilling our mandate to introduce God's Holy Spirit to our generation. Martha Rutza writes, Thank you, sir, for your powerful message. God bless you both. And Steve, your ministry is one of my favorite pages on YouTube and I am always eager for each new video. Well, thank you, Martha. We appreciate that comment. And the final comment on this video that I'm going to read comes from Johanna Martin, who writes, Thank you for this teaching. I have listened to it twice so far, and I will continue to listen to it often to remind myself of the wonderful counselor, the great comforter. I am humbled by this message. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for those comments. I want to encourage you for a moment. Matthew 6, 25, I'm going to read a few verses here, starting at Matthew 6, 25. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to Him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. You know, the enemy tries to assault us with fear. And if the enemy can keep you living in fear, then He can keep you from fulfilling the potential of living in faith. We live in faith knowing that God is going to take care of everything. I want to remind you, and I want you to hear me because this is important that you get this in your spirit. God's going to take care of you. You're going to be okay. I know sometimes things seem uncertain. People talk about inflation. People talk about economic collapse. People talk about future uncertainty, the stock market this or that, or this disaster causing trouble over here, or the job market getting losses over there. But you know what? No matter what the situation, God will take care of you. Why? Because you're His child. He loves you. So I want to encourage you to stop worrying. The Bible says these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. And then Jesus asks, why do you have so little faith? Has God ever let you down? Has God ever abandoned you? No. And He won't start doing it. He's faithful to His Word. He's faithful to His nature. And though others might be fearful, you don't have to be. Why? Because God will take care of you. Your future is secure in Him. Your future is bright in Him. He came that you might have life and life more abundantly. And it is from this place of faith that we become people who put the kingdom of God first. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and He will give you everything you need. You want God's provision? Do two simple things. Live right and seek the kingdom of God first. How do you seek the kingdom of God? You put 
God's priorities before your priorities. You put God's agenda into your life rather than your own agenda. You put the kingdom of God first by participating in kingdom expansion. And one of the ways that you can participate in kingdom expansion is through giving financially to this ministry. And I want to challenge you to do that right now. Look, all of this costs resources. When we produce the content, when we do the live streams, when we make lessons available on the Holy Spirit School, when we do live in-person events all around the world, all of that costs money. The running cost of the ministry takes resources. So we want you to get involved. Help us expand this ministry. Help us to continue going and growing strong as we spread the gospel of Jesus Christ all around the world in the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us do it. We give the messages away for free. The live streams are done for free. The events, we don't charge registration. The Holy Spirit School doesn't have a fee to get into the school. It's all free. Why? Because freely we receive, so freely we give. And we rely upon God touching the hearts of people like you who say, I want to participate because I love God. I love souls. I'm blessed by this ministry. I believe in the cause. And I want to put the kingdom of God first. I trust that God's going to take care of me. I know He's going to provide. I know my future is secure in Him. And that liberates me to, in faith, support ministries. So I'm challenging you. Let God grow your faith. Jesus asked, why do you have such little faith? Don't have little faith. Put your faith in God. And do that by sowing into this ministry. So I want to challenge you right now to give a one-time gift to help us continue doing this work or become a monthly ministry partner. If you want to see all of the benefits to being a monthly partner, go to davidhernandezministries.com slash partner. There are lots of things we do to give back to our monthly supporters, including a monthly Zoom call where we interact with our partners, give them information about the ministry. Their partners are the first to know any ministry announcements, And those Zoom calls are a lot of fun. We pray, we read the Word, we interact, they ask questions. I share about the future of the ministry. It's a good time that we have. And we want you to join in on that. So if you want to become a partner, that's just one of the many benefits. Plus, knowing you're helping to win souls, knowing you're pleasing God with your giving, knowing that you're helping to expand the kingdom. And all of that starting at $10 a month. You can't beat that. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So go to davidhernandezministries.com slash partner right now and see the different things that happen when you become a monthly supporter. If you can't become a monthly supporter, I encourage you to give a one-time gift. Or maybe you're not quite as familiar with the ministry as you want to be yet. You want to help, but maybe you're not ready to commit to monthly partnership. Well, then you can give a one-time gift by going to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. But either way, whether you're giving a one-time gift or whether you're becoming a monthly partner, put the kingdom of God first right now by giving to this ministry. Live righteously, seek the kingdom of God above all else, and He will provide everything that you need. You can trust Him. And that is it for this edition of Spirit Church here on the Encounter TV Network. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God. Thank you for watching Encounter TV. Don't forget to subscribe and click the notification bell. Also, help us spread the gospel of Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. Make a one-time donation or become a monthly supporter by clicking on the donate link now.